as we read from God's word uh, this morning, Psalm 118, 7 through 17. After that, we'll pray. And after that, you'll hear uh, from Pastor Brian, the word of the Lord. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of righteousness. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. To bow, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome time of worship, Lord God. We ask that you open the doors to every home, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit, your Holy Presence, just flow in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We thank you for giving us the ability to be able to exalt you, Lord God, to lift up holy hands to you, the Lord God most high. Father God, I ask that you forgive us of any sins that we have done or thought about in the name of Jesus that we're not even aware of, Lord God. I ask that you send your healing power in the name of Jesus through your people, Lord God. Touch those that are, have ailment in their bodies right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. Father God, if it's thine will, Lord God, those who will have financial burdens right now, I ask that we lift them up to you right now in Jesus' name, Father God, that you continue to be the Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, the God that provides all of our needs, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for waking us up and just giving us a fresh new opportunity each and every day, Lord God, just to stand before you, Lord God, and to exalt thine holy name, Lord God. Father God, in Jesus, we love you. We thank you, and we praise you for what you're doing in this season, Lord God. I pray that thine perfect will continue to be done in the mighty name of Jesus. And bless the man of God as he comes before us, Lord God, to give your people the word that you have placed in his heart, Father God. Let his word, the words that you put in his heart, penetrate our hearts, Lord God, to even bring us closer to you, Father God, to give us a deeper hunger, thirst, and passion for you, Lord God. Father God, I just thank you and I praise you and I give you the glory and the honor and thank you for the mantle that you have placed upon his life. In the mighty name of Jesus, be glorified. Amen. 
Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, grateful to have you joining us at City Light at Home. Um, we obviously would have loved to have you back here on this morning. For those of you all who are wondering, and maybe you're just catching up in terms of what has happened um, in the past couple of weeks, uh, we had every bit of intention and ambition to open up uh, our in-person gatherings this morning. Uh, we were hoping to see uh, people in seats, and then coronavirus took another turn. Um, and, and it has taken a, a pretty devastating turn. Um, if you've been watching the news and paying attention, you, you know that it has made its way uh, to the southeast um, in, the, in, in basically the southern region of our country in a significant way. And it has um, completely and totally flooded um, our communities. Um, hospitals are obviously uh, growing um, or reaching capacity in a lot of areas. Um, and, and, and so because of that, we made a decision, a conscious decision, a prayerful decision to back off of our uh, intentions to open on this morning. Um, as you know, we have a very small space and this space uh, fills up quickly and social distancing becomes extremely hard. And so when we get to the point that we are opening, um, and, and, and coming back to a regular service uh, or in-person gathering. We want to come back to an in-person gathering that has the ability for us to at least social distance with the knowledge of, with the, knowledge of the virus trending down, not with, the, not with the knowledge of the virus surging. And so if we had a bigger space, maybe we would do something different. But given in light of what we have, um, this, is, this is what we have to do right now. And so please pray with us. Pray for wisdom. Pray for guidance. Pray for direction. Uh, pray for this community, this city, this, this nation, uh, this world, that, that God would grant grace and bring um, a, a speedy end to this virus that has so uh, devastated our communities. Um, and, and then and lastly, I want to point out um, just another quick announcement as well. We are taking a, a, a summer break from our missional community virtual meals or our virtual family meals. Uh, so we will be relaunching missional community back in August. Uh, so for the rest of the month of July, we're taking a break. Please spend time with your families. Please don't stop reaching out to your church family, though. Please reach out. Please make phone calls, send text messages, email, uh, reach out through social media. Um, as I mentioned um, uh, last week, maybe you can find some opportunities through social distancing uh, to, to connect. But please find ways to connect with your church family, your church community uh, during this time of rest and relaxation. Uh, that we are um, that we are kicking off uh, starting this week, and so no missional community family meals for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the month. We look forward to gathering with you, hopefully um, in, in some capacity. Maybe at this point it'll still be virtual, but we'll figure that out when we get there. Right now, everything literally is day to day, um, as I guess it is in real life, in natural anyway. Everything is always day to day, no matter whether you're planning it or not. And so with that being said, um, again, I'm thanking you, thanking you for joining us this morning. Please turn your Bible to John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8 is where we're going to pitch our tent. John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. While you guys are turning now, I'm going to cut this fan on back here because, as y'all know, I like to sweat. And we're going to dive into Scripture this morning. I want you to look at verse 1 with me. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. We um, have been deep diving the role and the function of the church. And we've called this sermon series Church Life. It is a uh, sermon series that has covered a great deal of ground over the last five weeks. We have covered uh, the call of the church when Jesus Christ first utters the word church, ecclesia, the assembly, the gather, the gathered people, the called out ones, Matthew chapter 16, verse, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. 
And then we moved into the church as the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We talked about the church as family, Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 17. And last week we talked about the church as the commonwealth, the temple, the, the household of faith, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. This week I want to talk about the church as the branches in the vine of Christ. One of the big metaphors of scripture is agriculture. The most obvious reason for that, um, for that um, ideal or for that use um, of, uh, of a metaphor in scripture is because it is historically and geographically grounded. In the Bible, the Bible is an agricultural book. It is an agricultural book driven very much by agriculture and the cultivation of land. But another reason that is helpful to think in terms of using this metaphor is, is because agriculture ties so well to the human experience. Living and dying, growth and drought, the helplessness that the agricultural life can leave you feeling sometimes as someone who may be in agriculture. Oftentimes, you simply don't have control of the things that you need, or you wish at least, that you had control of. No matter how much preparation one can make, for example, a drought or an insect infestation could disrupt an entire season of crops. But another very important connection that the agricultural life has to the human life is the interconnectedness. Now, of course, everybody knows that I'm not an agricultural guy. I'm not a farmer. I'm barely cutting my grass these days. But in my life, I've had a few moments that I've been able to see the, this interconnectedness at work. One such moment was several years back when we were um, living um, about 15 to 20 minutes on the outskirts of the city. Uh, this was before we planted City Light. When we planted City Light, we actually moved into the city for that purpose. When we were living on the outskirts of the city, very shortly, uh, a night shortly after we moved in, we were all sleeping and we heard a loud, thunderous crash outside of our house. Sure enough, there was a lot of trees in, our, in, in, in that yard that we used to live in. And the, very, and the tree at the very front of the yard had lost one of its main limbs, one of its main branches. Got somebody out there, we did some cleanup, and we started getting prices on the cleanup, and started getting prices even on the idea of the tree coming down completely. And we said, well, how much is it gonna cost just to prune? And as we started talking about pruning, the, uh, the gentleman said, well, you guys might as well start thinking about what it's going to cost to bring this, bring this whole tree down. Now, why did the gentleman say we need to bring the whole tree down when we just lost the limb? Well, it was obvious that the reason that the limb was lost was because the root of the tree, and the trunk of the tree, was showing signs of death. And so all the limbs were not necessarily dead yet, they, but their vegetation, you can start seeing it go down and shrink. You can start seeing limbs weaken. But the trunk didn't look dead yet. Still looked like it had life, but it didn't have enough life to share. It didn't have enough life to give. And ultimately, as a result of it, even though the trunk looked okay, everything else connected to it was dying. What we are connected to in order to receive life really does matter. Here we see that Jesus tells us that his people must be connected to him. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. The vine is Christ and we are the branches. Our life comes through his life. Our vibrance is tied to his vibrance. Here Jesus gives us two truths that, that are worth holding on to. Just in this first verse, he says, I am the true vine. Not a vine, but the vine. There is no other source by which we can obtain life. In this age of partiality and 
partisanship and pandemics, I've been watching people from every walk of life grow more and more frustrated with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks that have been in church all of their lives are now saying, I'm walking out or I'm no longer a part of it because the frustration of dealing with church folks has proven too much for them to handle, so much so that they are leaving their salvation literally. But if that's you this morning, maybe the Lord happened to bring you into this broadcast and, and allow you to lock in and tune into this sermon. If that's you this morning, then I want to encourage you. Don't lose your opportunity to have life on the vine by focusing on a few dead branches. There is life on this vine and only life on this vine. The vine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't cast him aside because you're... Attention is now fixed on the imperfect branches. But he not only says that I am the true vine, he says I am the true vine. In other words, he, we, in other words we're moving the emphasis from the to true. You see, if Jesus needs to declare himself to be the vine, then that means there are a lot of people and objects and causes out there that might be confused for being the true vine. Can you think of some things that people like to look to as the true vine? Things that people like to look to or people that people like to look to as a source of their lives. I read a post on social media yesterday that said 2020 is the most important election of our lifetime. And, if this, per and, and this person declared that everything, and they were going to do everything in their power to help elect the nominee that they, of their choice, the candidate of their choice, because the future of Christianity was at stake. Let me fill you in on something. Christianity's future has never been, nor will it ever be, at stake. You read and hear these kind of words and, you know, where, where, where our hope and our lives are, are, have been subtly swallowed up by politics, nationality, economy, or comfort. Jesus, however, says that I am the true vine, not Donald Trump, not Joe Biden, not the Democrat, uh, Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, not my blackness, not whiteness, not the stock markets. No other source grants us life in this life and the life in the next life but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the true vine. But Jesus is not just focused on himself in this text. He turns his attention to the branches. That is you and that is me. He turns his attention to his church. The first point he makes is that dead branches are cut off. John chapter 15, verse 2, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. In this moment in our account, in our story, we find Jesus drawing a clear distinction between two types of branches. Ultimately, two types of people who are connected to, to his church, fruitful ones and unfruitful ones. Branches that are alive and branches that are vibrant and branches that are life-giving. Branches that produce life, branches that produce the beauty of life for others to enjoy. Branches that breathe life into others. And then those that do not. Even when Jesus trains us in how we should exercise discernment, he calls us to discern by observing fruit production. He tells us to beware of false prophets. He says, good trees only bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. Therefore, you will know them by their fruit. Living branches produce good fruit. Dead and lifeless branches either don't produce fruit or they begin to produce diseased and infected fruit. Fruit that is no longer useful. James, the half-brother of Jesus, makes a similar statement in his letter in chapter 2, verse 14, where he talks about the uselessness of dead faith. He says, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says, go in peace and be warmed and be filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? This is the language of 
productivity. But bear in mind, it's not just any productivity. For example, take note in verse 7. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. The fruit that Jesus is speaking of is a fruit that requires us to be prayerfully dependent on the Father in order to be productive. It is a, it is, the fruit is fueled by our commitment to rest in Jesus. If you abide in me, it is fueled by our commitment to walk in obedience and mindfulness of his words. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, this is the key to fruitfulness. It is a specific kind of productivity then. To drive that point home, look at verse 8. It says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The fruit that Jesus is speaking of is a fruit that will bring glory to God the Father. The second half of the verse, so prove to be my disciples. The fruit in which Jesus is speaking of is qualifying as good and healthy fruit in a living branch, or rather the fruit that qualifies as good and healthy fruit in a living branch is the fruit that demonstrates to others around us that we are in fact followers of Jesus. Again, this is not simply productivity for productivity's sake. This is not production for production's sake. One more observance about fruit. In Galatians chapter 5, popular passage, verse 19 talks about the works of the flesh, and it says the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When discussing fruit that is produced from living branches in the vine of Christ, we must understand that Galatians gives us the inner substances of that fruit. Again, Jesus is, is referring to fruit that glorifies God. Fruit that proves to us, to those around us, that we are disciples and fruit that consists of the qualities listed in Galatians chapter 5. Fruit that is coming from a living tree and is not produced from or produced for. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. This is fruit that is not coming from a living tree. But rather, the type of fruit that Jesus is highlighting is fruit that is produced from or produced for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, in Jesus' fruit production, the ends are not justified or do not justify the means, rather. You can yield what appears to be good results. But if your fruit is of a rotten substance, then it is not good fruit. Some people determine that if you have a whole lot of money, for example, then you have been fruitful. But that might not be true in the economy of the kingdom. If the money was produced through unjust means, for example, or if the money was produced by exploiting or destroying the lives of others, or if the money was produced by trampling on God's laws and commandments, then it is not fruit produced by abiding in the vine. If our church grows, for example, in the, in the next 10 to 20 years to be this huge church with massive numbers, but if we build it with a disregard for the handling of God's word or a disregard for the least of these among us or a disregard for God's standards of righteousness and justice as it relates to ourselves and as it relates to how we treat one another, then it is not fruit produced by abiding in the vine. You hear and you see Christians sometimes make the mistake of seeing a wealthy family or seeing a 
crowded church or seeing a popular person and immediately asking themselves, what is that person doing right? The answer sometimes may be, in fact, nothing. They might be doing anything right. They may look productive, but the fruit must be observed and examined. It could be rotten to its core. Have you ever had that moment in the store where you found yourself trying to pick fruit from the outside or pick fruit from the produce section and from the outside it appears to be okay? You pick it, feels okay, appears okay, looks okay, you put it in the bag, you check out, you go home, and then you cut that fruit open. And you find out that it's rotten to its core. You see, fruit in inspection sometimes requires more careful and cautious observance. What type of fruit are you producing? What type of fruit are you producing? Are you living the kind of life that produces fruit that brings glory to God, for example? Are you living the kind of life that produces fruit that demonstrates to the world that you are a follower of Jesus? Are you living the kind of life that produces fruit that is either produced from or produced for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Or are you unfruitful? Are you lifeless. You see, we know it's possible to present yourself as part of the vine while all along being nothing more than a dead branch. We know it to be true when we, for example, we read the, the story of Judas. We discover a man who followed Jesus throughout the entirety of his ministry. Practically everywhere Jesus went, Judas was there. Practically every sermon Jesus preached, Judas heard it. Practically every miracle Judas or Jesus worked, Judas witnessed it. And yet, in the end, we discover what? That he was a dead branch. He was around Christ, but he was not abiding in Christ. His life was not invested in Christ. And thus, he was not producing good fruit. And eventually, he was cut down. This is not a New Testament thing. We see the imagery of vine and the imagery of being cut down in the Old Testament as well. We hear it in Isaiah chapter 5. It says, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a vine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O oh, 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 inhabitant, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to be to what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it waste. It shall not be pruned. Briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Isaiah was, was describing the vineyard as Israel. And this vineyard, God said he had no choice but to destroy it, lay waste to it. Why? In verse 7, it says he looked for justice, but behold, he only found bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, he only found an outcry. Israel was no longer fruitful. They were no longer producing justice for the least of these among them. They were allowing un injustice to go unchallenged, unabated, unobstructed. Instead of righteousness flourishing as it should have been, the people were crying out for unrighteousness running rampant through their nation. Israel was not fruitful and thus they faced discipline. 
This is what happens when our lives individually and our churches collectively exist lifelessly on the branch. Dead branches get cut off. But fruitful branches is what Jesus turns his focus to in the second half of verse 2. It says, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Vines that produce require pruning. Vines that produce require pruning. In order for God's people to be productive, we must be a pruned people. You know, my wife and I, we have these two really beautiful crepe myrtles in our front yard. And every spring, these, these crepe myrtles, they grow big, beautiful flowers and big, beautiful leaves. And one tree produces like a cream-colored flower, and the other tree produces like more of like a, a hot, a, a, a hot pinkish almost type of color. And the trees produce this great beauty every year that enhances the rest of our house, the rest of our yard. It just looks really, really, really pretty. But those trees every single year go through a process. Every single year those trees go through a process besides growth. They're pruned. Anytime before or between late winter to early spring, we hire a landscaper and they come out and they prune the trees. They don't, they don't just go and just hack away and chop at them. There's a skill to pruning. But they cut. And they cut branches. And they cut different, different spots. And by cutting, they are making way for the tree to grow back in the spring healthier than ever more beautiful than ever. And here's the interesting thing about that. Neither one of those trees have a chance of growing as big and as beautiful as they can be unless that pruning happens. Production, fruit production, requires pruning. So pruning is not a bad thing. Pruning is, in fact, a necessary thing. Pruning is, isn't the sign of death. It's the sign of life. We prune our plants and we prune our trees when they are actively producing in order to ensure that they continue to produce. When they're no longer producing, we just cut them down. Listen to what Spurgeon says, Charles Spurgeon says about pruning. He says, pruning then is for fruit bearing. If the branch is dead, what would be the good of pruning it? Say not, dear friends, that your afflictions must be caused by your sins. Rather, they may come in consequence of your virtues. Because you do bear fruit, it is worthwhile for the husbandman, that being God, to use his knife upon you, that you may bring more fruit. Most of us interpret trials in one way and one way alone. We say, what did I do wrong to deserve this? But what Jesus is telling us here is sometimes the better question is, what fruit am I producing to bring about this moment of pruning? Be careful not to see every trial that you are enduring as a sign that you are doing something wrong. That job that you lost, those friends that, you, that have abandoned you, that illness that has caused you so much grief. There's not, now, now, there are times where there could be judgment at work. There are times where there could, that, that God could be dealing, uh, disciplining you because of sin. But what if God is allowing these trials at times? Not because you're unfruitful, but precisely because you are. Jesus' brother again in James chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What if these tears that you are crying right now in your bed at night are meant for your sanctification, that you might be able to help somebody else down the road when they're crying those same tears on their pillow? 
What if it is a what if it is being used as a deepening of your compassion towards others and your patience with others and your grace towards others and your generosity towards others? What if these trials are being used to fortify and deepen your dependence on God in a way that you would not have done without the trials? Old gospel singer that I love and hold dear says in one of his songs, Some of y'all wouldn't pray unless you had to go through something. That it's the trials themselves that refine us and sharpen us, and, and, and that pruning in turn makes us more fruitful. So sometimes the pruning comes because we're fruitful. Fruitful branches require pruning. The permanent branches require abiding. Permanent branches require abiding. You know, we highlighted a verse in Isaiah chapter 5 where it talks about God basically destroying the vineyard that was called Israel because they had forsaken him and they had, instead of um, pursuing justice, they had made a mockery of justice. Instead of pursuing righteousness, they had made a mockery of righteousness. But Isaiah speaks of a shift of this vineyard in chapter 27. He says this, In that day a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. I would burn them up together or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. You know, you, you know the difference between the vineyard in 27 and the vineyard in chapter 5? is the presence of the Lord in that vineyard. Because God is now the overseer of that vineyard. This vineyard is a, is a foreshadow of Jesus' words in John 15 where he says, I am the true vine. In other words, we aren't the source of life. We are connected to the source of life. Israel standing apart from that source of life has no sustaining life. And neither do we. Standing apart from that source of life, we have no sustaining life. We have no sustaining vitality. We cannot bear fruit long term. Israel must be connected to me in order to flourish. Israel must be connected to Christ in order to flourish. This is the point of verse 4 where he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. We are lifeless. We are fruitless without our connection to the eternal true vine, Jesus Christ. Our ability to produce and be sustained is all directly tied up to our perpetually, to our perpetually abiding in the vine. When we stop abiding in the vine, we lose the ability to produce. It's not a one-time connection that you can step in and step out of. Perpetual abiding in the vine. It's a permanent, organic engrafting that forever feeds us what is necessary to live a fruitful, abundant life. How do you abide in the vine? Jesus tells us, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So abiding is about abiding or being connected to Jesus' words. It's about internalizing his words. It's about letting those words 
be lived out through you. It's about letting those words lead and guide you. It's about letting those words shape and mold you. You abide in Christ by abiding in the word. You abide in Christ by abiding with him in prayer, by staying connected to him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done. We abide by staying connected through prayer, by staying connected in his word, by resting in his love. For he says in verse 9 of chapter 15, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. How you do that? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. How do we abide? How do we become fruitful? How do we remain fruitful? By resting and abiding in Jesus. How do we abide in Jesus? By resting in his word. By staying on our knees in prayer. By walking out his commandments and living out his commandments. Lastly, here's the reward for abiding in the vine. Verse 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. What's the reward? The reward for abiding in the vine is you are given more capacity to bear more fruit. Is that, the, is that if I stay connected to the source of life, then blossom comes every spring. If I stay connected to the source of life, then bloom comes every spring. I'm able to continue to produce. Why? Because I'm connected to the source of production. And in so doing, who is glorified? The Father in heaven is glorified by my life, with my life. The Father in heaven is glorified with my actions. The Father in heaven is glorified with the fruit that I produce. But here's another fruit that we see, or another reward that we see. Verse 8 again, the latter part. And so prove to be my disciples. Here's the apologetic of fruit production. See, our apologetic, our defense of our faith is not just with words. Our defense of our faith is with deed and action. It's with the production of fruit. I hear what you're saying, but I don't see, I don't see anything. But here we hear Jesus say, that you bear much fruit and so prove. By bearing much fruit and giving glory to the Father in heaven, you are proving to be my disciples. There is apologetics at work. There is a defense of the faith at work when we live a life of fruit production. When we live a life where we aren't satisfied with injustice around us. When we live a life when we aren't satisfied with hatred around us, when we live a life when we aren't satisfied with those that are close to us suffering with no companions, when we live a life where we aren't satisfied, where love is not flowing and flourishing in our midst, when we live a life where we aren't satisfied, when peace isn't being made in our midst, we are fruit producers. Why? Because Christ lives in us and we live in him because we are connected to the vine. That's what the crucifixion does for us. His death, his burial, his resurrection, our faith and repentance engrafts us in the vine. And by being engrafted in the vine, we now become fruit producers. And that fruit production demonstrates to the world, it shows the world, that those people are sent by God. That God is in them. And they are abiding in him. You know, Maya Moore is a famous WNBA player. And she quit 
took a pause last year at the height of her career. She's not just an NBA, WNBA player. She's one of the best WNBA players, not just of this particular group of WNBA players, but one of the best that's ever done it, one of the best to ever play the game. And she was in the prime of her career, and she quit. And you say, well, why did she quit? She quit because there was a man who had, who was falsely accused and in prison serving 50 years for a crime that he did not commit. Maya Moore got wind of this story, and the more and more she dug into it, the more and more her heart was compelled to act. So she took an entire year off, announced it, and said she would return back to the WNBA, but she wanted to take this year off and spend this year laboring and working, using her power that was available to her and her resources that were available to her to see that this man found justice, to see that this man got justice. And this past week, Mr. Jonathan Irons, I believe, was released from prison. Fruit production. Maya Moore is a well-known believer in Jesus Christ, but she doesn't just allow her words to prove her faith. She allows her fruit to prove her faith. And she put her fruit on display. And as a result of putting her fruit on display, someone's life, someone's life was saved. What do you think those around Maya Moore say about her Jesus when they see that kind of production. May it be said about us as we sacrifice, as we, maybe we're not Maya Moore, maybe we don't have the ability to sacrifice in the way that she did, but there are so many other ways that we can imitate our Lord and Savior in our fruit production. So may it be said about us when we are laying our lives down in small and big ways that those people love Jesus and they walk with him and he walks with them. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you and we give you all the praise and glory and honor. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us to abide in you. Teach us to abide in you, Lord God. Teach us to abide in you. Help us and strengthen us to abide in you. And Father, we pray that you abide in us. And as a result of that abiding, Lord God, may we produce the fruit that is pleasing to you. God, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name.